As of the time of this recording, there are now over 1,075 games that have been announced to be released at the Essence Spiel trade show. If you played one a day, that, that's nearly three years worth of games. And if you decided for some reason to make a video series listing them, well, that's a, that's a countless number of days that you won't realize is time that you'll never get back until it's far, far too late. But regardless, let's continue now to my next batch of my top 100 picks from the Essence Spiel. Hello and welcome back to this Pair of Dice Paradise special series of my top Essence Spiel picks. Now, for this list, which is presented in no particular order, I am focusing on games that I haven't covered yet in other recent videos, along with games that have a 2019 English release date. And that still leaves more games to discuss than you can shake a stick at. So put down the foliage and listen, because game number 71 is coming up next and it is Flotilla, a dice rolling game for three to five players by WizKids. Did you know that in what I promise is a completely relevant note, in 1954, with an explosion over a hundred thousand times more powerful than even the wildest estimates, the Castle Brava nuclear test exploded some stuff over in the ocean area. The ocean area in question was the Bikini Atoll, and this explosion ruptured the earth down to its mantle. And as water levels rose in the aftermath, the remnants of humanity fled their homes and took to the sea. This part may, may now be fiction. World leadership came together then to build a massive flotilla, mankind's last bastion of civilization. And now, ten years after the disaster, the flotilla is home to the very last of us. Humanity. Me, you, Earl, probably. He's human. Sure. Flotilla features two distinct and interwoven modes of gameplay, as you try to outpace your opponents in bringing prosperity to humanity's new home. Earl's home, maybe. Otherwise, you begin the game as a sink side fleet commander, commissioned by world leaders to explore this new face of the ocean, scour the depths for resources, and rescue any survivors that you might just happen to come across. But, at any time in the game, you may choose then to turn skyside by selling off your skiffs and leaving your seafaring life behind to instead grow the flotilla itself. And as players turn skyside, different niches are filled, forever changing the game's economy. And mastering this ebb and flow will be critical if you're going to shape the new face of humanity in your image, or just, just shape it by helping out and being humanitarian, because the humanity part of it. It doesn't have to be all about you. It, sometimes it's about Earl. Will you build the flotilla by being the first to go skyside, or will you stay sinkside for the whole game, becoming the most powerful seafarer of them all? But even more importantly, who is going to repair this massive rupture in the very mantle of the earth? Not me. Certainly not Earl. Number 72 is Super Fantasy Brawl, a fantasy brawling game, obviously by Mythic Games. In the land of Fabulosa, powerful magics have rendered war obsolete. So, with nothing else to compete for, and unwilling to use these magnificent magical powers to repair the Earth's mantle, the bored populace has turned to the Super Brawl for entertainment. These powerful magics are now used to reach back into the timeline to pluck out the finest warriors from every civilization in order to compete them against each other in the greatest entertainment spectacle ever staged since your daughter's sixth grade three hour homemade drum concert. Super Fantasy Brawl is a fast paced competitive miniatures game in which players select a team of three champions and combine their unique action cards to create a synergistic action deck. The game is faction free, so players have the choice of any combination of champions that they want to use. In each turn, the players use their hand of action cards to maneuver, attack, displace enemies, and claim objectives to score victory points. And every action card in Super Fantasy Brawl is attributed to one of three core concepts which govern all magic in Fabulosa, <laughs> of course, come on. There's creation, destruction, and manipulation. The objectives in Super Fantasy Brawl are only scored at the beginning of a player's turn, ensuring that you always get a chance to disrupt your enemy's plans and position your champions to score the objective for yourself. This tactical to and fro continues until one player reaches that victory point threshold, then declaring themselves the winner and advancing towards victory in the Super Brawl tournament. Which is nice. It's nice to have an actual winner, because really, there, there's no winners in a 6th grade 3 hour homemade drum concert. That. That I can tell you. 
Number 73 is more than likely On the Origin of the Species, a city-building game with a splash of biological evolution, or evolution, by Mont Tabor. Here's something you can do for me. Go and assist Charles Darwin during the Beagle journey across the Galapagos Islands, discovering new species and researching them in order to improve your knowledge. Right? Just jot that down and do me a solid. During their turn, the active player must choose between two actions, researching and placing two different species onto the board, and thus gaining new knowledge of air, land, and water habitats. Or discovering knowledge about the habitats that they have already acquired, obtaining victory points, and evolving the game state. No word yet, though, if evolving the biologically curious platypus scores a player positive or negative points. Who knows? The game finishes when the beagle reaches the last space of its trip, leaving the archipelago through New Zealand. And then, the player who correctly said archipelago on their very first try, thank you very much, whoever has the most victory points wins. Number 74 is Chakra, an abstract strategy game for two to four players by BLAM! In Chakra, each player has a board that shows the seven chakras that they must fill with gems that represent the energy flowing into their body. To score points, each player must harmonize each of their chakras in the best possible configuration. And to do so, they must take the gems and place three of them on the corresponding color in each of their chakras. During a turn, each player, who starts the game with several inspiration tokens, chooses to either take up the three gems from one column and place them on top of their individual board, move gems up or down by a number of chakra spaces to reach a perfect alignment, or meditate to reclaim an inspiration token. When a player manages to align five of their chakras, the last turn is played and then you perform your final scoring. So breathe deeply, let the whisper of thought come to your ear, that is nice, and harmonize your chakras and then let go so that the negative energies will just disappear. Or don't, because really, I don't care, I'm not your dad, so be tense. I, Number 75 is the science fiction civilization card game for 1-5 to five players. It's a wonderful world in which each player manages an expanding empire and must choose the path to their future. In the game, players will carefully plan their expansion to develop their production power and then rule over this whole new world. As long as they can do it faster and better than their competitors. So, how do you do this, he asked rhetorically, because you can't have a two-way conversation on YouTube? Well, each round, players will draft seven cards and then choose which ones will be recycled to immediately acquire resources, and which of those cards will be kept for construction to produce resources each round and or gain some victory points. When a card is fully built, it is added to the player's empire to increase their production capacity each round. But, <laughs> there's a twist! That twist being that the production phase works in a very specific order. So, you have to plan your constructions carefully, otherwise... <laughs> well, really, honestly, oh my goodness, I, I don't even want to tell you about how embarrassing it would be to have that happen, so just mercy me, no. Each of the game's campaigns offers a storyline, though, and at the end of each campaign, players will open a reward booster to unlock new cards, to provide new options and content for the game as it progresses towards a final, wonderful world. And you know what makes my world a wonderful one? Well, the following product that I can only assume I can't live without and I probably highly endorse. Unless it's complete rubbish, in which case, screw it. Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. The names have all changed since you hung around, but those dreams have remained and they've turned around. Number 76 is Lovelace and Babbage, a real-time number manufacturing game by Artana. In Lovelace and Babbage, players adopt the roles of 19th century computing pioneers including Ada Lovelace and Charles Babbage. Each player, then, has their own unique abilities and subroutines, providing asymmetric gameplay and new challenges. Programming an early mechanical engine, players compete tasks for famous 19th century patrons who award influence in such areas as art, science, and engineering. Turns take place in real time, with players competing over a mix of personal and shared goals as they all program the engine simultaneously. Speed, then, and accuracy are both rewarded, so different playstyles and levels of ability can all mutually succeed. And while all that stuff can sound somewhat complex, the game actually has an estimated 15 to 30 minute playtime, which actually surprises me after hearing its description. So that's why I'm intrigued by Lovelace and Babbage. 
unsure whether I should be excited for this game or fear it because of its methodical, mechanical mathiness. Let's say that number 77 is the self-published fantasy adventure card game Dragon Hunters. Then, let's continue by saying that Dragon Hunters is a place where three reckless heroes, an avenging Amazon, a warlike half-orc, and an intrepid mage, face a deadly and somewhat terrifying dragon with treasures hidden within its lair, as dragons are wont to do. But, he continued, the dragon is not the only opponent here, as the hunters themselves, as in their own greed and their thirst for glory, can ruin any well-executed plan. Which, haha, <laughs> surprise, it then does. Meanwhile, though, the dragon is not just sitting around on his treasure lollygagging. No, the dragon will never stop, and in this game, it continues with the not stopping until it destroys everyone who has dared to invade its lair. Oh, and this dragon? In addition to the typical fangs and claws and wings, this dragon also creates illusions, burns its enemies, and summons dutiful dragon whelps to aid it in battle. Quite the ambitious dragon, this. And so, it will be up to the players themselves to decide whosts amongst them will be the lucky hunter to receive the treasure, and whosts amongst them will fall to the dragon's attacks. Marty, if it has to be someone, I can say right now with near certainty, it's, it's going to be Marty. I forgot I wrote that part. <laughs> okay. Number 78 is The Grim Masquerade, a card game of bluffing and deduction by Druid City Games, which takes place in the enchanted kingdom of Beauty and the Beast. But this time around, the Beast has invited you to his castle for a fancy masquerade. This surely cannot be a trap. But when you enter the Beast's realm, you are then magically transformed into the identity of another character from the Grim Forest. It was a trap. Yes, the Beast does certainly enjoy his antics, and now players must struggle for their very survival. No, that's not right. You just gotta figure out who each other character in the game is. In the game, players will have access to various artifacts. They'll lose if they receive two artifacts of their bane, but they can win the Magical Masquerade if they're able to collect three artifacts of their favor. And don't, don't worry, though, if you're outed early, because then you take on the role of a ghost. A ghost. Okay. Perhaps the players are actually fighting for their very survival. As a ghost, you get to guess what character you think will win the Magical Masquerade, and if you are correct, you win right along with them. The first player to collect all three artifacts of their favor, or be the last player standing, wins the game. You also win if you turn out to be a particularly precognizant ghost. Number 79 is Moonshiners of the Apocalypse, a morally questionable, not so cooperative game of town building with a tad of dice combat for two to four players by Too Fat to Fly. The description of Moonshiners itself states that this is the one game that you need to stay away from if you worry about dark humor, morally questionable choices, and drinking with your enemies until they pass out. Set in an alternative post-apocalyptic 1920s that is not the Psy of the Universe, players compete over exploring and rebuilding a deserted shantytown while simultaneously fighting off the hordes of disgruntled crowds that roam the town. Did I say fight? Because this game's description says that the combat in this game is actually trying to drink your opponents under the table. So arm yourself with a crate of the strongest booze, some hangover aid, and start drinking, because any unchallenged enemy will hunt you down and wreck your buildings. Wow, that's, that escalates pretty, pretty quickly there, game. Where's the city council when all this is going on? You know, you'd think that this behavior violates an ordinance or two of some sort, but no, nobody listens to Chaz. That's, that's how all those cats ended up on the roof. Explore, expand, exploit, and exterminate, scavenge for resources, raise distilleries, produce moonshine, and sell it in your saloons to maximize the profits, because when time is up, only one hero will be able to pay for the ride out of Shantytown and win the game. And number 80 by Alley Cat Games is Chocolate Factory, set in the early 20th century of entrepreneurs and chocolatiers experimenting with new ways to create and market chocolates. Now in this game, you, right there, have just been assigned the task of chief chocolate maker, because never mind repairing the Earth's mantle, there's, there's chocolate to be made. Chocolate Factory is a Euro game of literal factory building and moving chocolates, using a pushable conveyor belt component. And using this, you must push your way towards completing the most chocolates for the best value. 
and during the game, players will initially draft new factory parts to add to their player board and specialists, which are one-time use cards with special powers. But careful consideration will be required for the spatial element that this game also has, as chocolate pieces can only be manipulated during a push by the factory part that is adjacent to their tile. Players will then score points by creating chocolates for public and personal objectives. And the player with the most points at the end of the game wins it all. Unless the Earth's mantle ruptures any further, then we, we all lose. But hopefully it's not, it's not going to come to that, and you'll be able to join me again in just a few more days for the next batch of my top picks from the games coming out at this year's Essen Spiel. Till then, I've been Chaz Marler from Pair of Dice Paradise. Take it away, Earl. What happens when two board game media makers join forces? I, I don't care. But if I did care, I would tell you that Marty Connell from Rolling Dice and Taking Names and Chaz Marler from Pair of Dice Paradise team up as Team Vest in this 24-inch by 14-inch playmat. Khaki Gaming Vest not included.